recall in the derivation of the slope deflection equation that we ultimately ended up a, with a load related term that became associated with the fixed end moment. And we called it that because it's the effect in the end of end moments when you have fixed ends and then you have a load that's applied within the member. And so usually we look these things up in tables. We don't derive them, but where do they really uh, come from? And that's the subject of this uh, short video is to go through that. Now there's two basic approaches that one might use to derive those. And the first one we'll talk about is how we might use the flexibility method to do the derivation. And so that starts with, of course, recognizing that we have a redundant system from a force perspective that we're not going to look at the axial, so that means that we only have two redundancies that we're going to consider. We're going to turn this fixed fixed beam into a pin roller uh, system, and we're going to use as our positive sign convention clockwise rotations at those ends. That might seem counterintuitive, but we're using more of the sort of absolute sign convention approach. Right? So that's our primary structure and the degrees of freedom that go along with that. So we're going to look at then breaking down or decomposing then this total real system into the primary system with the various loads applied. So the primary load being, of course, the actual load. It seems a little odd to call the concentrated load uh, W instead of P, but that's what we've got here is that total force of W at the midspan. Right? And of course, we have a deflected shape that's a nice smiley face, and the displacement in the middle would be PL cubed or WL cubed over 4080i. We've we know that one having done it so often, but symbolically here we have this theta one zero that happens at the first degree of freedom. It physically is going in the uh, counterclockwise way, so the number that we would come up here would be negative because of our sign convention that we have up here. Theta two zero is going to be, of course, the rotation that happens at the second degree of freedom in the primary uh, loading scenario. It's going to end up being of course a positive value corresponding with our sign convention for degree of freedom 2. That's the first set. Then we sequentially put unit loads on. So for the first degree of freedom we put a one unit load on and that would be a one kip foot for instance. We calculate the rotation that goes with that degree of freedom. It's a flexibility coefficient because the load is one so that's F11 at the other end and yes that would be a, a ultimately a positive value. F21 uh, it goes the other direction, it would actually be some sort of a negative value. And then likewise, we uh, add to it the system when we put the unit load on the other, one, other end, and so on and so forth. And of course, we don't know what the actual va um, end reaction values are. That's the whole point of the flexibility method is to find those. So we have to multiply this middle case by the uh, actual but unknown value of the redundant reaction, R1, going along with that. That's way out here at the right, and then R2, the moment at the left. Sum all those up, and then we'll end up with two compatibility equations. Right? So we'll just go ahead and write those to reinforce what we're doing here. We're not using the slope deflection method here. We're using a different method, the flexibility method, to set up how we will then later use the slope deflection method. So, all right, we've got two displacements that we have released, so we got to put that all back together, and we just have our classic then compatibility equation that we write, and likewise for the second one, and can note these this pattern that emerges and everything. We can rewrite that into a matrix form that we're somewhat now familiar with taking these over to the other side and then we get the flexibility matrix times our vector of redundant reactions ultimately. All right, so that's um, a process anyways. We're not going to go through the numbers of how we find those redundant reactions and then we can find the other two which turn out to be very uh, natural and what we'd expect. Now the other approach you might have used to uh, conduct the derivation comes from the the derivation of the slope deflection equation itself. So we, these leftover terms that are associated with the load were these ones that were out here, right? That this A sub M referred to the area in the moment diagram between the, the two ends, 
there's A and B, and this X bar then referred to the moment arm of that area with respect to one of the ends. The A means with respect to end A, the B, uh, so B with the B end. In this case, because of the symmetry of the situation, uh, those will be identical values. But there's your X bar A, X bar B, and in this case, both equal to L over 2. So let's just even apply this formula, see if it works out that um, that'd be the fixed end moment AB. And that's going to be equal then to 2 over L squared times the area of that moment diagram, which is then, of course, 1 half of the base, which is L, times the height, which is WL over 4, times the moment arm, which is then L over 2. And then minus 4 times over L squared times that area, which is 1 half times L times WL over 4, times then its moment arm XB, and that's L over 2 as well. So check this out here a little bit. We're going to take it a little bit in stages. This middle, we'll have 2 over L squared times then WL cubed, 2 times 4 times 2 is 16, minus then 4 over the L squared, and we'll have WL cubed again over 16 in this particular uh, instance. And when you work out the math there, L cubed over L squared, of course, is just L. That's WL. And we get a 2 over 16 minus 4 over 16, or in other words, 2 over 16, i.e. WL over 8. But the last term will dominate, so we have a minus WL over 8 as our fixed end moment for AB, which is on the left side. Now, remember here that I'm going to draw this up here, that the sign convention is clockwise positive for our formulation of the slope deflection equation. So that minus on the left actually says that we have a counterclockwise moment being applied in response to the load. Now, when we go do the same thing, note that the 4 and the 2's swap roles here, and in our case, then it's really easy to see that the fixed end moment term BA is just going to be then the positive WL over 8 in this case, and positive means clockwise, so there's your WL over 8. Here's the actual loads that go with that, and then with no surprise, given all that symmetry, that the end shears or the fixed end shears would be P over 2 in this case. And that's how you would derive then what you find in the tables for those fixed end moments. Now, that shows them the way they're physically acting. That allows you to use different sign conventions should you want to. But you have to look out for how somebody uh, reports those values. The signs that we got down here were entirely about how we were had set up the original sign convention in these equations, so therefore these have to be interpreted using the positive clockwise approach.